Uh, hopefully you're wrapping up your hay season, getting all your hay harvested and putting in your hay lots like this lot right here. And uh, it's pretty hot here today, but in just a couple weeks, they're gonna have a little dip in the air. It's gonna start getting cooler and whatnot. And it's gonna be time, to, well, we call it fence building season. Uh, it's time then when you wanna repair those fences, corrals, you wanna expand them or in complete brand new uh, corral systems. Now, <clears throat> what we're doing today is uh, we're just gonna help you uh, determine the best materials to buy for you. We're gonna talk about the different materials that are available and the pros and cons of each. <clears throat> so we're gonna call this video uh, uh, how to buy fence materials or not to buy. And this is part one of a two part series. And uh, <clears throat> uh, who am I? If you don't follow us, um, I'm Bob Studebaker. I'm the owner of uh, Go Bob Pipe and Steel. I'm also the owner of Go Bob Cattle Company. Uh, and I've been in the steel business since 1975. And be between 1983 and 1994, um, I was in the oil field pipe business. In 1986, I became NORM certified. You may wonder what, what NORM means, but in, in, in the series, we'll, we'll go over that with you. But since 1994, uh, I've specialized in livestock fencing in all types. And uh, uh, so I hope you enjoy the video and, and learn something from it that you can use. All right, we're gonna talk about vinyl real quick here. I won't spend a lot of time on it because I would not recommend it for a corral. I mean, it, it just won't work. But for a nice perimeter where you're containing livestock, the pros are it goes up quick and boy, it really looks sharp when it's brand new. But it does have some issues. Um, you know, a lot of people advertise this stuff as maintenance free. Uh, if you'll see, as you see on this fence, that is actually mold and mildew. And you're gonna find that uh, on any vinyl fence that's been sitting out for a while. And uh, so you'll have to come along here with some Clorox or something periodically to clean it up. But the biggest problem is, is this demonstrates right here, this is where some animal has, has pushed on this rail. And of course it's gonna flex, bend, and it pops out. So what this uh, landowner is gonna end up doing, I'm sure, uh, he doesn't have a hot wire on it now, but he'll end up putting a hot wire on the backside to keep the animals off of it. And that kind of, to me, that kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, but anyway, we won't spend any more time on vinyl. Let's go on to something else. We've covered vinyl and uh, we're not gonna spend much time on wood either. Um, we gotta cover it though, because all the original fences and corrals were made out of wood but we had a real hard time finding a wood fence. And uh, of course the one we found kind of way I expected it to be. Wood doesn't, uh, just doesn't hold up. If you're gonna do wood, just plant on a lot of, a lot of maintenance uh, all year round, about every year. The planks fall off, the wood posts right off in the ground. It won't hold paint. Um, you know, sure it's cheap, uh, that's the pros. and and you could do it all 100% yourself. You don't, all you need is a saw, a hammer, and nails. Uh, really not recommended, but uh, uh, it, does, it does exist. Uh, it'd make a nice ornamental fence around the front of your house, but I sure wouldn't contain livestock with it. Let's go on and uh, uh, let, let's talk about steel. Steel is, that, that's, that's the way to do fencing and corrals these days. And so let's cover that now. Well, folks, we've talked about vinyl and we've talked about wood. Um, the last thing we need to talk about is steel, and it's by far the most popular uh, corral fencing that uh, we use today. But, uh, you know, there are two types of steel. Um, there's used steel, uh, then there's new prime steel, there's new reject steel, there is uh, secondary steel, and then there's limited service steel. And uh, so you really got to be careful what you buy. Uh, we're going to talk about used steel first and uh, uh, some of the problems with it. Now, of course, uh, the pros are uh, it's pretty easy to work with. You know, if you're a welder or if you can, you can hire welders pretty cheap. Um, and you got to have some real good looking pipe. But the problem is with used material is that you can't see down it. Uh, the outside may look perfect. There may be no, no pitting, no holes or anything, but <clears throat> there's some things that goes on inside of used uh, downhole pipe, oil field stuff. Uh, a lot of people don't know. Um, I was in that business for almost 10 years 
And uh, so I do know a little bit about it. And let me tell you what that is. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that uh, happens on uh, U-Steel pipe, one of the, the problems is, is that these days, there's typically more salt water produced in the well than there is oil. Um, you know, somebody's got a 15, 20% oil cut, they consider themselves very fortunate. So uh, what that means is for uh, uh, every 100 barrels of oil, there's 800 barrels of salt water that's produced through it. And I think we all know what salt water does to, to steel. Um, another thing that happens down hole in the well is there are uh, uh, certain things that uh, 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 they're actually uh, not chemicals, they're uh, um, uh, hard substances, calcium and whatnot, that will form over the perforations in the, in the casing. And so oil and gas operators to combat that, they'll put acid down in the well to eat those uh, uh, calcium deposits up and clear the openings. Well, that acid doesn't, isn't really good for that steel either. Now, but the biggest culprit, the biggest thing that, that destroys oil field tubing, and again, it's one of these things you can't see from the outside, is what we call rod wear. You know, <clears throat> most people uh, that I talk to that uh, you know haven't been in the oil business, uh, they assume that an oil well is just a straight hole. Um, but ever since uh, rotary drilling came into vogue, there isn't a straight oil well in the country. Uh, they're all, just by the nature of the drill, I'm not gonna go into what causes it, but they're all actually in a spiral. And you'll run tubing down the well uh, which you're going to produce the oil from, and then you're going to run sucker rods inside the tubing, which actuates a pump down at the bottom, and as that pumping unit on top pumps, eventually that oil comes to the surface and continues to flow as long as that, uh, uh, that pumping unit is working and there's fluid in the hole. But what that does is it causes the rod, which is inside a spiraled piece of tubing, um, to wear on that tubing on the inside. And it does it uh, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And because of the nature of the, uh, uh, the lifting mechanism, that sucker rod has to be harder than the steel that's in the pipe. So that means you have a harder steel rubbing constantly on a softer steel. And eventually what happens is, uh, it wears, if not a hole, they'll just be places that are really thin. Now, this fence here is a good example of uh, uh, what could happen to you on used pipe. Um, I know these folks. Um, a matter of fact, this is just a couple blocks over from our mound's yard. And uh, <clears throat> he tells me this pipe was beautiful uh, when he first installed it, but he wasn't aware of the corrosion and whatnot that was going on on the inside. And so what's happened is, this pipe is actually rotted from the inside out. And now he's got an even bigger expense. It might have been cheaper than going with a new product when he first put it in, but now he's going to have the expense of taking this all out, and then he's going to replace it with some new fence. And, but that new fence will, will last him a lifetime. He'll never have to replace it, and he'll never be faced with an issue like this. Um, <clears throat> but there's one more thing. Uh, that used pipe, if, if you're not, uh, if the salt water, if the acid, if the rod wear doesn't scare you, I need to talk to you about one more thing. Remember when I said I was NORM certified in 1986? We're going to talk about what NORM is right now. What is NORM? NORM is an acronym. The N is for natural. The O is for occurring. The R is for radioactive and the M is materials. Now, there's a lot of complicated nomenclature that goes when, you know, uh, describing norm and, you know, the alpha particles, gamma rays and all that stuff, but I'm going to just make it, make it plain and simple. Here's what happens. This radioactive material is down in the Earth's crust. When, when Oil and gas producers are bringing oil up out of the ground. As that oil cools, the radioactive particles 
uh, and the pressures caused by the oil production adhere to the inside wall of the tubing and sometimes the outside wall under special uh, cases. Now, is this dangerous? Yeah, you bet it is. It's not the it's not the type of radiation where you see in the movies where if you get close to it, you'll get this radiation poisoning. Uh, that's not it at all. Um, but what it does do, if you inhale the dust from it, or if you touch it and then uh, put your hand to your mouth, or you say you're building pipe, or you're, you run your hand down pipe and you stop me at a sandwich, that's how it can get ingested. Now, he, here's the problem with it. Here's what makes it so dangerous. The type of radiation that's in this stuff seeks bone in your body. It likes the density of the bone tissue, and so it goes there, it concentrates, and it accumulates there. And since the shelf life of this is like 1,600 years, it's going to be in your body past your lifetime. And that's a lot of time for it to cause damage. Now, the most, the most frequent damage caused by norm uh, ingestion or inhalation is bone cancers and bone abnormalities. Um, this is why if you've ever taken a load of, tried to take a load of scrap to a scrap buyer, uh, they're going to have a Geiger counter or something out there to go over what you're trying to sell them. And if they detect some radiation, they're going to turn you down. You're going to have to go somewhere else to get rid of it, but you're probably not going to be able to get rid of it. Unless, guess what? You take it to a farmer or rancher and say, hey, would you like to buy this pipe? Uh, you know, it's a good fence pipe. And that's how a lot of this used pipe that's norm contaminated has made its way into our fences and corrals. And a lot of us don't even know it. Uh, how would you? I mean, who, who would expect you to invest in a, in a Geiger counter to check all the pipe that comes in there? You know, this is, this is why you need to deal with a responsible uh, pipe vendor. And it's critical, absolutely critical, um, if you're using used pipe and to us, it's not worth it. It's not worth, it's not worth the chance. And, uh, and that's why Go Bob concentrates on selling new pipe. Now, granted, new pipe that is made for its original purpose is super expensive. Uh, if you went and got some brand new oil field tubing and casing to build your fence, well, there's, there's no way you can afford it. But, fortunately, if you know how to get it, how to buy it, how to get the contracts to get it, there are byproducts of new pipe, and we're going to talk about that in the next series.